My name, full name is Cecil Clayman, C-L-A-Y-M-O-N, Grimes, and uh, I've always been called Clayman uh, by my family and all, and um, I live in Georgetown, South Carolina. I'm not a native of Georgetown, but I've been here since 1945. I was actually on the front porch of a friend's house in St. Stephen's, South Carolina, where I graduated from high school. And uh, um, uh, when I, when the Japanese hit Pearl Harbor, and I, we'd been hunting, and I came in, and somebody said, "You know, the Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor," and, they, and uh, that's when I first heard of it. And uh, I, was uh, that was in '41, and I was what uh, I was born in '22, so it made me 19. Yeah, I realized that. Um, I mean, I was young, and you know, all I realized we went a war, you know, and something was going to happen. My father was in World War One, and so I sort of knew a little bit about war, and and uh, I just. Uh, so uh, at the time, I didn't really think anything particularly, except I d just understood that we were at war and there was going to be some kind of pro problems coming down the, the road, of course there were. My mother and father wouldn't give me permission to join. You had to have, you, were, you could join if you were 18 or older, but you had to have parental permission and I couldn't get per to give me permission. I was um, in... Um, law school at the time, and uh, first year law school, and uh, I, as uh, soon as I got to be 21, I went down and signed up, and I wanted to go in the, what was the Army Air Corps at that time. I really wanted to go in the, in the Naval Air Force, but my mother had, she was afraid of water and afraid of flying, and I figured that the two put together would be too much for her. So I, I joined the, what was the Army Air Corps at the time. And uh, uh, I was sent off then, I left, I guess, in 43. I went to uh, Miami, Florida, and went through basic training down there. Then Pat, he had to take an examination to get into the air cadets, and I got into that. And uh, finally went through flying training, went to um, uh, Little Rock, Arkansas, outside of Little Rock, Arkansas, for primary flying training. And the washout rate was pretty high. They were very quick to wash you out, you know, and the most washed out cadets became bombardiers or gunners on planes, but uh, I was lucky I was able to make it. And we we uh, went to, I went to basic training in Kansas and then went to the third phase of training in, down in Texas on the border down there. and. That's where I uh, got my wings and was commissioned in what the class of 44C, which would meant March of 44. And I was commissioned and checked out in uh, the old P-40. That was the first fighter plane I flew. That was an experience because you didn't have anybody else in the plane. You just had to read the book and get in flights, you know. <laughs> and, uh, but once you've done it, uh, then you, once you've flown a plane, then what you do, you had no problem flying any plane. You read the book and get in flight, you know. It'd tell you what, what thing to, the things you had to look out for and that sort of thing. And, uh, and from there I went to, uh, uh, I went home for a short furlough and then went to, uh, uh, Richmond and was then sent from Richmond up to, up to uh, I was assigned to fly P-47s and 
I checked out in P-47s in Richmond, and I went up to, uh, it was right near Massachusetts. And, uh, uh, we used to you know, go into town there and party on the weekends, you know. And, all that. and anyway, I, I was, we were supposed to, I thought, go to the Eighth Air Force. That was what we were supposed to do. But the fellows I met when I first got into school, a fellow named Dan Mathis, who was a close personal friend, he became a close personal friend, he was killed overseas, and a fellow named Paul Chisholm, he was also very close, he's still alive. And uh, somehow we all managed to stay together, and for some strange reason, they sent everybody to the 8th Air Force except us, and they put us on a train, I think it was something like a dozen of us, and we rode all the way to the West Coast. I never understand why they did that. To Washington, and sent us to Hawaii. <laughs> and we joined the... Uh, 78th Fighter Squadron, we were assigned to the 78th Fighter Squadron as what they call yard birds back then. That would mean, mean you were a raw recruit for, for, as far as they were concerned. And it was the old spit and polish outfit. They'd been there ever since the Blitz in 41. And a lot of their classmates were uh, had high ranks, some of them were generals and all, and yeah, they were majors and colonels and captains, and they were just really sort of PO'd at the, at the, they felt like the deal they had wasn't right, you know, and, but they were a very spit and polish air outfit, and they could fly. And uh, we used to, I, I never forget, the Air Force was supposed to be sort of a, Easy going, sort of bunch of crowd, crowd, you know, and not that outfit. You even if you were a young second lieutenant, you saluted an old second lieutenant when you passed him. That was how damn technical they were. But anyway, we were right on the beach, and it was fun. We had uh, it was good. We had good training there, and uh, the uh, captain. The Captain Tap was the uh, man I was assigned to, I think. I don't know if Captain Tap is still alive or not. I saw him a couple of years ago because he was several years older than me and I'm 85 now. So uh, Anyway, um, I was assigned as his uh, element leader and I used to fly in his flight. He was an excellent pilot. And uh, we... Uh, all of a sudden, we get some orders that we're getting P-51s. We were flying P-47s. And we got these P-51s in. And uh, they sent us three. <coughs> and so everybody had to sort of take their turns flying them and <coughs> to check out in them. And uh, then they told us we were going down under. That meant somewhere in the Pacific and into combat, and we actually didn't go under the below the equator, but we we were assigned to Iwo Jima. But we went to Saipan first, and uh, I only had I think eight hours in a P-51 when finally went into combat. We got to 51s, and uh, they put them on a air a baby aircraft carrier, and we. Went across the ocean with no escort, but they put one P-51. <laughs> this is I'd have thought back then on a catapult, and it had a jab, a sub, what do you got a depth charge, several depth charges attached to it, and they told us that um, they had that the they, they, uh, we hadn't done it, hadn't been checked out to be catapulted off of P-51, but that it worked, they knew it would work, and that if we had a Japanese sub uh, attack us or detected while we were to catapult this P-51 and go out and drop a bomb on it, see, and uh, try to keep it off, that was the sport we had. <laughs> I know it sounds silly, but that's what they told us. 
and we got in there and you had to take your check your turn sitting in this P fifty one on this catapult and never you never had been catapulted with. And also they told you you could not belly land a P fifty one. You know, we learned that. There's no way to land it back on that little baby carrier anyway. But you can't barely land a piece of one in the water. It'll, uh, that scoop will suck it down and just in a matter of seconds, you're down to 100 feet in the water and you'll drown. So you have to bail out if you, so it said you'd have to bail out and they'd pick you up. So it was a little nervous sitting there and taking your turn sitting in that 51 as you went down, but we didn't get any uh, sub sightings or anything. So it was pretty, they unloaded the P-51s and put them on there. Uh, feel at Saipan. We were there for, I guess, two or three weeks while they got us, got the planes all checked out and ready to fly. Cause we we're gonna fly them to, to um, Iwo and land on Iwo. See, as soon as the jazz, the uh, Marines captured the first airfield down there, and. Uh, uh, and of course we did, and we, in the meantime, we just sat down there and pat, uh, I know I swam a lot, and we used, used a little, uh, we didn't have scuba gear back then, but we used a lot of, uh, uh, what they call skin diving gear, you just dive down to shoot fish, you know, it was right a, a good uh, you know, interval there, you know. And, the water was real clear. There's one place there where the Japanese had been, when the Saipan was taken, they had been forced into this corner and they, uh, up on this mountain. And they refused to surrender. And they had, they had uh, some women and children with them. And they said they actually threw the women and children off of this cliff and then jumped over themselves and committed suicide. And you can see the bones of the people all down there on the uh, coral on this cliff there. It was a horrible looking thing. But that's when you realize how really determined the Japanese were that they, because we'd heard all kinds of talk about it anyway, but I know that would impress me. and. Uh, Anyway, we flew on up to, Iwo, to uh, Iwo Jima and landed on the airfield. They hadn't even paved the uh, first airfield. They had uh, rolled out these mats. Uh, they had them rolled out really in case a B-29 got hit. They could land there and the crew could and the crew couldn't get back, it could land that all. And that's what we landed on was a match. It's right below Mount Suribachi, where they hit that beach and all those Marines were killed. And um, we got out and they were fighting on the upper end of the runway when we landed there, airplanes there. It was really, uh, we just sort of got there right off the bat, you know, and then flew a few missions there. Um, but uh, it wasn't anything you could do about the Japanese. They were all holed up and in caves and things like that. Marines just had to get them out by using these flame floors that they put in these caves and all. It was a horrible thing. And we'd go up there only when you had time off from flying. Of course, we immediately started flying up to Chichi Jima and we would uh, bomb Chichi, which was a small island similar to um, uh, Iwo uh, with a book written about that, about Chi Chi Jima. You remember that? Uh, and it uh, called uh, Flyboys, I think he called it. And uh, uh, I can't remember the name of the author right now, but I read it. And um, uh, and the Japanese would, uh, you know, that's where President Bush bailed out. And he didn't go to shore. He, and they picked him up. Uh, but if he'd gone to shore, you know, tell him, they, they would take, you know, that's where horrible things. They would take uh, 
the prisoners and they'd make them wait on them and then they would finally cut their heads off and eat the livers and all that. One of the most interesting things that happened, well, we'd already been flying missions to Japan uh, covering the B-29s, but a Japanese destroyer escort went into Iwo, to Chichijima, apparently to deliver supplies or something there. And um, Navy patrol boat spotted it. And so they told us about it. And we loaded our planes and went up there. And uh, had these, we had these six inch rockets that uh, we'd put under the wings of the plane because the Japanese had stopped sending up their airplanes. They were saving them for the invasion. And so we would have to go down and shoot the hangars and try to shoot the planes up on the ground after the 29s got through their bombing. And one of the first flights of planes uh, shot these rockets into this destroyer escort. Right, the destroyer escort's a little smaller than the destroyer. It's the right good size ship. And he hit the steering apparatus, and the thing went round and round in circles. And they, they couldn't get a, out of range, see? And so we would come back, load up, and take, and I never forget, uh, Major Tap told us, said, now shoot right at the water line. So if you shoot right at that water line, uh, the 50 caliber bullets that we have in our machine guns will penetrate the hull. And we can sink that thing. And so we did. That time after time, we should fly it. And it sank. It started going down. And the Japanese were all in the water and everything. And it was quite a, an experience. But then uh, we flew these missions over Japan. And <coughs> uh, I had a friend who is spelled Paul, well, Dan Mathis was killed in a weather accident. Going to going up there, well, we lost 21 airplanes. We had this stupid general try to take us to a, <laughs> a thundercloud, and uh, lost 21 airplanes on that trip. We went on. I was I was on Major Taps. I was in this flight. We went on up there and and uh, carried out our mission. Those missions were over eight hours long. And you had to fly the plane, didn't have any uh, automatic pilot, you just flew it. You had three machine guns in each wing. And the uh, two outboard guns would give out of ammunition first. And when they gave out ammunition, you knew you only had those two inboard guns. And that was sort of a signal you better head back home, so you did. On this one time, it, I went up there. I uh, Chisholm was with me, and we were ch stracing an airfield at Osaka, and he got hit, and his plane caught fire, and he pulled the plane up and flipped the top off and bailed out, and uh, and he was only just a few hundred feet off the ground and bailed out and he opened his parachute and it just opened just before he hit the ground. And I flew back over him and the flak was back and forth across the field there and I, I knew I was in danger of getting hit. Uh, I flew back and he was jumping up and down like, come get me, you know, whatever in the world I could do. <laughs> uh, we, uh, we used to get air, um, newspapers from town, and uh, I mean from home. And there was an article in there about a pilot and uh, a P-51 pilot in Europe who a buddy of his was shot down and he had to bail out, was shot and hit and dogfighting had to bail out. So he landed in a wheat field and he landed in that wheat field and threw his parachute away and let his friend get in the plane and sat on his lap. See, you couldn't, see, it was just a one-seated plane, but you had this big parachute you sat on, so there was room enough to sit on another person. And he put him in there and 
flew back and rescued him that way. And so we had sort of a pact that if one of us got shot down, the other would land and pick him up, you know. <laughs> I guess that's what he would want me to do or do it in the world, the way I could land and all that. So uh, uh, when he got out, and the uh, war was over, when he got out of the prison camp, the first thing he said, buddy, why didn't you pick me up? <laughs> he called me on the phone. <laughs> uh, but anyway, Chisholm got shot down. 30 days before they dropped the atomic bomb. And uh, he, uh, they, he said they captured him and put him in a... First thing he did was interview him. And he said, he just told him everything he knew. He said it wasn't, you know, the stuff about name, ring, and several number, you forget about that because they're going to get it out of you. So he just told him everything he knew, you know. Then he got through, they said they treated him nice at first, and then they started beating on him and, and uh, put him, said he put him in a prison camp, put him in a four foot high bamboo cage. And that was his quarters. Had no, they'd stick a bowl of gruel in there once a day. He said it had maggots in it. <laughs> and that's all he had. And uh, he was a real finicky fellow. He'd go eat, if a fly lit on his plate, he'd throw the whole thing away, you know. So now he just didn't eat anything. And uh, when uh, they dropped a big bomb, all the guards just disappeared. And they flew in these different Navy helicopters at different uh, places and prison camps and all, and uh, he was picked up and brought back out. And he weighed 110, 110 pounds, 115 pounds, I guess it was, something like that. And uh, he'd weighed 147 pounds when he bailed out. But in a little over a month, he lost <laughs> something like 30 pounds. I don't know, you could lose that much weight in a month, but he was just skinny. He didn't eat anything. And he had diarrhea, you know, real bad. I was, I was darn glad they'd done it. I, I had the feeling that, you know, and I think, not any question, we'd have lost a million men in the invasion uh, if uh, they'd gone through. And uh, if they'd had, and that's what we were getting, gearing up for was for the invasion. And uh, the uh, people in charge of uh, the Japanese samurai, they, as far as they were concerned, that was every every civilian would just die to the death. You know, you just had just that's what it was. You know, uh, you know the uh, kamikaze attack. Uh, kamikaze means divine wind. You know, it's you know why that when the Chinese centuries ago tried to take Japan in a hurricane or a typhoon, sank the fleet and all. So that was the idea. Of what the, Kamikaze, yeah, you just carry it to the nth degree, and a, and a divine divinity or some kind of divine thing will save Japan. And of course, the <coughs> uh, emperor of Japan, you know, was supposed to be a god, and uh, and most of the Japanese people believe that, and. Uh, uh, when he finally, he goes to let the samurai run everything, but when uh, he realized that he and his family could be obliterated by an atomic bomb, he uh, wielded his authority and, and stopped the war. And even they couldn't, even the samurai wouldn't go against him. See, the missions were about eight, eight hours long, and you got credit, you got so many points for the long-range missions. I'd flown a number of short-range missions, too, like a Chi 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 And uh, uh, they, you got so many points for however many missions you had, and, uh, and the ones with the highest points got to leave first. And, uh, I was in that bunch that left first. <laughs> I, when the war was over, I was ready to come home then. 
And um, I didn't do a thing but take a, uh, a bag and throw my stuff in there and get on the plane and head out for home. <laughs> and I uh, uh, came back and got out of the service and uh, went back and finished law school and uh, met my wife before I finished law school. She had roots in Georgetown. Uh, she was a pilot. Uh, she was a, uh, had six aunts and uncles and they, did, and, that, and they didn't have any children and, and her father only had one child so she was the only child and she spent a lot of time in Georgetown growing up and all so I and she was um, her family been in her father's side been here since pre-revolutionary war days and all and I uh, finished law school and I had to go somewhere and practice law until I just came to Georgetown and hung out of shingle. We decided we'd move to Georgetown. We got married in the old church here in Georgetown. And, well, I just hung out of shingle, started practicing law, and ran for the, back then, the lawyers couldn't advertise, you know. And uh, I was, oh, was, there were only, I think, six lawyers in town. And uh, only about four or five other active ones, and uh, and I was naturally hungry and looking for business, and about the only way you could sort of legally advertise was to run for politics and uh, get your name before the public, you know. So I ran for the house and got elected, and then uh, judge. Uh, Judge Morris, and then he was a senator, and he got elected to the Senate, so I ran for the Senate and got elected to the Senate. So I stayed in the state Senate then for, I guess, 10, 11 years before I uh, got defeated. But anyway, I stayed in the Senate, uh, and uh, I guess my biggest claim of fame was I got the <laughs> state to pass the mini bottle bill, you know, the <laughs> which wasn't very popular in that part of the state, but uh, we passed that, and uh, uh, I uh, <clears throat> finally I've just been practicing law ever since, and I just I still remember the bar. I don't practice anymore, really, but. My son handles the practice now. Well, of course, uh, anybody who was opposed to the war and during World War I was just sort of persona non gratis, you know. You, uh, even if you were against it, uh, you got drafted and you could maybe go into the medical corps or something like that, you know, but uh, uh, you just, nobody would really be opposed to the war. It was just a matter of uh, survival of the country and you just felt like that was the only way to go. And, uh, and the attitudes nowadays, of course, about war is so different. And, but back then, you know, you did whatever it took to win a war. And, uh, and when we developed the atomic bomb, we were losing, we were fighting an enemy that was so dedicated and, uh, and determined to, to destroy us that, uh, there wasn't any question about it in my mind that that was the thing to do. You had to, we had the means to do it. Let's end the thing, win it, get it over with. And that's what we did. And I certainly have no regrets about that. I had an experience, uh, which I've told a number of people about. I was in, uh, on a mission to Japan. Uh, and 
we had finished, uh, I've forgotten, I believe it was, I, it, was it wasn't a mission that uh, Chisholm was on, that he was shot down, but I believe it was uh, uh, over Osaka, or near Osaka. And, uh, you know, what we would do, when we flew up there, we had a navigational B-29 that would take us up there. A B-29 had a cruising range about that of a, of a P-51. And they, would, they had navigational equipment that we couldn't put in those little small fighters. You know, P-51, you can see wingtips right out there, you know, it's just a little tiny thing. And the only thing we had were uh, some some homing equipment, if you could get about within 100 miles and get high enough, you could home in on something. You could have a radio device where you could uh, turn it on and it would give you, we called it an uncle dog. It would, uh, if you turned, it would go da da dit and da dit dit, see? And da da dit meant that you needed to turn it to the right and did and did that dob and you had to turn to the left. And when you did and that you got headed right straight to it, you would get a steady boom instead of a did did da and da da did. So it would blend together. And uh, there was a homing device that we used. And that was about the only navigational equipment we had other than the compass and and uh, and uh, we had charts, estimated charts where you could estimate your flying time and things like that. But uh, we just didn't have any sophisticated equipment. And so we had to have a B-29 to take us. We rendezvous with the 29s that were going to uh, bomb. We'd rendezvous with them off of the coast of Japan and fly in cover for them, see. And uh, we'd stay above them and if a Japanese fighter came and we'd go down and try to shoot it down and get it away from them. And uh, on this particular day, the Japanese were keeping their planes on the ground pretty well. And uh, but anyway, I got into a dogfight with a Japanese plane. And uh, I was running low on gas. And so I I just had to break off the dogfight, and uh, I believe I could have shot him down, but he was a good pilot, and, and uh, so I, but I had fooled around so long that, and I had lost, my wingman had just, he disappeared. I don't know what happened to him. I, I know he was shot down or what, but uh, I start, I realized that I'd, when you see when you got through the mission, what you do, you go back to a certain place off Japan, and you'd, meet up with the B-29 navigational plane, and he would be circling the same place you left, and you'd have to look at the coastline, and you could tell roughly where he was. Now, you'd go back, and you'd see him there, so you'd get on his wing, and he'd fly and take you back over Evil. See, that's how we all came back. We just got around this fellow, told us home is down this way, and he took us there. But on this particular time, I waited too long, and the navigational plane had already gone. And when I came back out, I said, oh my, uh, what am I, I have no navigation, all the planes had gone. I said, good God, I just knew Evo was somewhere in that direction, you know, general south, and I figured I'd get maybe within 100 miles of it. But I had my oxygen equipment had gone bad on me. And uh, I could fly at altitude. Uh, you know, you, uh, you breathe on those planes, you had a mask you used, and it uh, pumped oxygen in according to the height in so that you could fly at 30,000 feet, you know, and still get enough. To, otherwise, if you uh, uh, got too high, you'd get drowsy and you wouldn't know where you were, and first thing you know, you'd just pass out, crash, you know. and so you had to watch out for this oxygen deficiency thing. So I now was with no oxygen, and I, so I couldn't fly much above 15,000 feet. And I said, oh my, I'm in a, and there was an undercast down there at about 10,000 feet, and I said, what in the world am I gonna do? I, so I just sort of headed out in the general direction of where I thought I should go, and, I was just looking at the compass, and I looked way on the horizon and saw this lone B-29 flying. 
And I said, this is my lucky day. So I went flying up to him and pointed at my earphones and got him on the common channel that we talked on, radio channel, and I told him what my problem was. And he said, don't worry, buddy, I'll take you back. So I said, oh, boy. And I told him about, uh, I'd have to go, if I had oxygen uh, problems with my oxygen system, I'd have to go down periodically because he was about 20,000 feet. And I couldn't stay there very long without going down and getting um, some air, you know, some fresh air. So I'd go, and about the second, about the first or second, about the second time I'd go, went down to get air. I know, I know where I do, I'd take you, take your gloves off. They taught you this. You take your gloves off and wash your fingernails. And when they start getting blue, you know you're getting low on oxygen. You go down and... And I was, that's the way I was flying back with him, you know. And also, you begin playing bounces up and down like that. You can't. You, but anyway, you, if you were flown enough, you can recognize oxygen deficiencies. And so I was going, and I came back up, and they were waggling. He was waggling his wings up and down and pointing. And there was a Japanese fighter out there, a Zeke, sitting up above us like he's getting ready to make a run on us. So, um, I gave it the gun and went after the plane, and he apparently was uh, not a very smart fellow because he tried to outdive me. And uh, uh, those Japanese fighters could outturn you in a tight turn if you were slow, but in a fast turn, you could outturn them if you're going fast enough. So when he died, he was my meat. I went right after him, you know, and I hit him, and I saw pieces fly off of him. And uh, then he went into the clouds, and uh, I didn't see him anymore. And uh, so I came back up to the uh, B-29, and they were giving me V for victory and, and all that. And, and that, like they were so proud of the fact that I'd chased off that fighter, see? so. Anyway, well, except with going down and getting air periodically, the rest of the trip was sort of uneventful. And finally, I, he got me close enough to Evo, I saw it, and I just thanked him, went on and landed. And in 1985, my wife and I bought a place, a little place in the mountains. We still own it. And we went up there, and... Uh, uh, <clears throat> there was a fellow who would come down, he was sort of an elder looking fellow, had glasses on, and he would come with his cane, little dog and wife, and he'd walk down there every day, and he said, um, I understand you bought that place, and I said, yeah, he said, you bought it from the whites, he said, yeah, and he said, well, you know, I used to rent this place from them every year for about a month, I said, what if you do the same me and I said we're not going to rent a place we just want to come up here when we can and it'll be tied up and I said no I, and I got there I sort of hurt his feelings he'd be a nice guy so I said well why don't you come on and have a drink you know and so I got so he did and <laughs> brought his wife over there had a nice little Yankee gal he was married to and he lived in Miami Florida that part of, uh, this is up near Grandfather Mountain. And uh, this is actually on Sugar Mountains where it was. And um, they used to call those people the uh, uh, halfbacks. Uh, they say the Yankees had moved south and they would come halfback doing they would get too hot, they'd come halfback and walk, <laughs> get to the mountains up there. But anyway, uh, <coughs> We, on this particular time, he came over to the house and we were talking. And I asked him what he did, and he said, well, he was retired, he used to fly for Delta Airlines. And that um, he would retire and live in my, I asked him where he lived, he said, live in Miami, and I said, no. I said, where are you from? He said, Miami. I asked him that on the street out there, I said, where are you from? He said, Miami, and I said, no. You're not from Miami. You might live in Miami, but I can tell from your voice you're not from Miami. You're from somewhere in the deep south. He said, well, I'm from a little town in South Carolina you probably never heard of. And I said, hell, I'm from South Carolina. I can tell you what, what town are you talking about? He said, I'm talking about Greeleville. 
I said, good Lord, I graduated from high school at St. Stephen's. I used to ride my bicycle over to Greeleville on weekends and see friends over there. And he said, yeah. So we got talking. We got you the same people. So that's, I asked, that's after that I asked him to come to the Lord have a drink, you know. So I got talking with him, and he said that he was retired. used to fly for Pan Am overseas. And he was retired and lived in Miami. And uh, I moved to Miami, you settled down there. And uh, I said, um, well, how, where'd you learn to fly? He said, well, I flew in the war. I said, where'd you fly? So I flew B-29s. I said, well, I'll be damned. The only place B-29s were at the Mariana Station. And I said, I used to fly 51s off by you. And he said, oh, I'll be damned. Said, we were on the same missions probably. I said, yeah, we got to talking off. And he brought up a subject. He said, you know, one time he used to, I forgot the reason he was up there. He was late getting back. And he said, I, this plane came up to me, a, a P-51, and said he was lost and, had, and needed to go back. And he was the fella. And he told me, I, I said, I didn't even prompt him anything. He told me the story about being out of auction, having to go down. The only thing he saw, the plane hit the plane I shot, he saw it hit the water and explode. See, I'd have gotten a credit for a kill instead I got a probable on it. But anyway, uh, and that, uh, after that to me was on the other side of the world, and this fellow saves my life who lives in Greeleville by taking me home, you know? <laughs> And we knew the same people. Well, he's dead now. But he, That's uh, an amazing story. Yeah. There, name, was, uh, name was Farrelly, Ray Farrelly. Well, people don't realize what we're doing. We're fighting the Crusades again. Yeah. You, know, you know, we did that. That war didn't last but 400 years, you know, before. <laughs> and uh, King... Uh, Richard the Lion Hortage, you know, he's uh, used to lead these crusades over there and all and fight the Muslims and I don't know, I maybe, I guess there are, I just don't understand this Muslim business, you know, it's like, you know, they fight among themselves, it's like the Baptists fighting the Methodists because they don't agree with that, you know, with a war over it, you know. It's sort of silly. They have a different attitude about life and death and all than we do. And uh, I just think that the Muslim religion is, hmm, to me it's just, it's just anathema. And it's a tragic part, you know. Uh, uh, I, can, I have a friend that was a prisoner of war in uh, Germany in World War II, and he talks about how, you know, they, we would burn and bombing the German people. And he, called, he talked about how, you know, we, he was walking down the street uh, with um, a bunch of prisoners when they, the Americans were bombing German, he saw. And said these old women would come out on the side of the street and hand, hand them cups of water to drink. And yet, uh, we kill them, you know. And of course, that's just the way, I guess the way a warrior is. That's uh, unfortunately, but that's part of it that you have to deal with, and uh, you know, the Germans had dropped the, what, those damn things that went up, came down at, in the middle of uh, nowhere and just uh, bombed, uh, hit uh, London and killed people, innocent people, just happened to be there and they'd kill them, but that's part of, part of war, and I guess any time you get in war, that's what you get involved in, and uh, it's just, uh, well, war isn't pleasant, no matter how you look at it. <laughs>